All right, welcome back. Uh, this is the afternoon session for the testing automation mini conf. Uh, I don't have much to say. I just want to introduce our next speaker, Svetlana, to talk about some property based testing stuff. So please welcome Svetlana. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, okay, so my name is Svetlana. Uh, I'm a software developer at ThoughtWorks. Uh, and I'm going to talk about testing today, testing a quality. And uh, it's not every day that software developer is talking about testing. So this is your lucky day. I hope you're going to enjoy it. Um, so it's all started for me from functional programming. Um, and um, I started to practice functional programming like a few years ago. And um, I really love it. I discovered these uh, awesome libraries, uh, Quick Check in Haskell, and there is Scala Check in Scala. Um, so, speaking about functional programming, it's uh, it has really nice and useful things, which actually found their way in the mainstream technologies. Uh, for example, I don't know immutable data structures or uh, monads like dealing with nulls and exceptions. Uh, or even lambda expressions and many, many more things. Uh, but property-based testing, for some reason, didn't find its way to mainstream yet. At least I haven't seen it uh, widely used, which is, which is really a shame because property-based testing is quite an awesome tool, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So the idea of property-based testing is quite simple. Uh, so you get a, an input for your test. It's randomly generated input. And you run your test multiple times with this randomly generated input. You find the first input, which makes your test fail. And then you report an error. Well, if you couldn't manage to find uh, a randomly generated input, which makes your test fail, it means, it means your test passed. And yeah, that's easy. That's the whole idea. Um, so let's have a look at a simple function like square root. Uh, I hope everyone knows it. It's like square root of 9 is 3, square root of 4 is 2, right? So what you do first when you test it, like normally you would write some example-based test. Um, and example-based tests, they're like normal tests. They're called examples because you actually provide examples here. Uh, you say, OK, square root of 9 is uh, 1 is 1, and square root of 9 is 3. Uh, this is like normal test, which I don't know, which you can find in tutorials about TDD from Uncle Bob. And they're quite all right. Uh, in in property-based testing, what you do is you start by defining a property or like assumption. Or if you're like a scientist like and you like mathematics, you can say this is like a theorem. Um, so here for square root problem, uh, our property could be like this. We may say that for any x of type integer, the square root of multiplication has to be this value. And this is quite fair assumption, right? Um, so once we run the test, uh, they would probably fail. Um, and as, as you saw in my property-based test, I didn't provide any numbers. I didn't provide any uh, examples. Uh, and I didn't even think about the range of integer values which needs to be provided for this property. Uh, so what happened was, by running the test, the report actually told, told me that, you know what, I'm failing because when I provide a randomly generated negative number, your property is not correct. Um, and like at this stage, you just go and change your property by saying, okay, for any randomly generated integer, the multiplication, uh, the square root of multiplication is an absolute value of this generated integer. And th at this stage, you're probably going to get, get um, um, all the tests passed, maybe. Um, so this is the whole idea. Uh, what I'm trying to say is once you write properties, you don't actually, actually need to think about the range of the values or age cases for the properties. This will be, this will be told you by the tool. Uh, and this will be discovered by you. Uh, so property-based testing by itself, it has two important components. It has obviously properties, or these assumptions or theorems, 
and it has generators. Generators are the things which, which actually provide the values for, or examples for your properties. Uh, for example, this is a simple property of a string, right? So uh, it says like, for any string, any random string, if you reverse it, and then if you reverse it back, it has to be the same string. And it does sound like a theorem a little bit, right? And it does work if you run the test, it, 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 it should work. Um, so for the test like this, uh, you, you would provide like a generator. And luckily enough, in uh, quick check or Scala check, you have uh, standard generators for primitive types, for like numbers and strings and booleans and stuff like that. And um, uh, here, you don't actually need to construct your generator. It, it, it is provided for you. Um, here, you have like a little bit more complicated example. Uh, and this also like a property of a set. Let's say you have a set of book, any random set of book, and you convert it to JSON and then you convert it back from JSON. Uh, and your assumption here, your theorem is saying that, okay, the converted result has to be the original set. Uh, does it make sense? All right, so these kind of uh, assumptions or theorems, they're also known as round trip tests. Uh, you probably even have them in example best tests. And uh, I think they're the most useful patterns of usage property-based testing and in like applications, I don't know, in like business enterprise kind of applications, the round trip tests are like super useful because you always have like saving to database and getting back the same record or converting to JSONs and different other formats. And this is useful. Uh, so in terms of generator for such a property, it's, um, it's gonna look like this, basically. Uh, you're gonna end up using the standard, uh, the standard generators from uh, Scala check or Quick check or any other library. And you're gonna combine those standard generators to create an object you're gonna need. So that's, that's how it's gonna look like. Uh, so what's interesting here is once you run a test, and it doesn't matter if it's gonna pass or fail, what you can do is you can collect the generated data and then you can see that uh, you, just ran, you just ran your spec with this input. You ran it on an empty set of data. You run it on, an, on a set which, collect, which has like only one, uh, one book or you can run it on a set which has like lots of books. You can run it on a set with book with like a empty string as a title or Chinese symbols as a title or uh, negative year. Uh, so the range of input is pretty much everything you can possibly imagine. And you don't need to think about it, you don't need to provide it, and look at the amount of actually lines it takes to write a spec like this. So by actually writing less, you do end up with uh, quite a huge amount of tests. The coverage is quite big, right? So next th thing I wanna do is um, I wanna test a game. Um, to be honest, I always wanted to be a game developer. I've never actually ended up being a game developer. But um, this is Space Invaders. Anyone know Space, Space Invaders? Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the best game in the last 100 years, uh, maybe, by my ratings. Um, so we can, test, we can try to test a game like this. Um, before we actually start testing the game, it would be nice to know how it works. Um, this is my uh, object-oriented diagram. So we have a game. Uh, we have a laser cannon. We have like set of invaders. And we have some set of bullets which comes out from laser cannon. Um, so also in a game, we have a game loop. I actually don't know exactly how like games develop nowadays. But I remember I actually wrote a game in a language called Lua, and there is a framework called, called Love, and you end up, end up actually writing a game loop which, which updates the screen in this loop. So in our game of Space Invaders, we would probably have a loop, and we would run it until like all the, while all the invaders are alive, or invaders didn't reach the border, because if they did, it's a, it's a game over, right? So inside of the loop, we would move the invaders and we would update the screen, right? Somewhere else, we would also have like a listener for space key uh, when we shoot out of the cannon. 
And what we need to do is we, well, we need to shoot. Um, also probably gonna have a listener for like left and right errors and uh, mo to move our cannon. Uh, maybe we're probably gonna end up writing way more code than just this. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering what kind of code is that, what kind of language, it's a, it's a pseudo code. It's a, it looks like Scala because I've been writing too much Scala recently. Um, so now let's think about tests. Um, anyone, anyone saw this before? So this is called testing pyramid. It looks weird, but uh, have you ever heard about testing pyramid before? So if haven't, if haven't. So when we think about design of our tests, we want the structure of, we want our tests to, to have a shape of a pyramid. What it means is at the uh, foundation of the pyramid, we would have unit tests because they're so easy to write, they're so easy to maintain, and we can write lots of them. Uh, and the foundation of the pyramid means you're gonna have way more unit tests than anything else. Then you have integration tests. And integration tests, they usually test like a few components, how they're working together, right? And you have, you have less integration tests just because it's really hard to write them. It's, uh, it's also quite hard to maintain them. Um, and then you have functional tests. And functional tests are the tests of the end result of your application. Let's say uh, if you write a command line tool, then the functional test will be actually running this command line tool in a common line um, with like all the possible options. Um, and at the end you have like the cloud of explorational tests. Uh, they are manual tests, like the tests which are run by like really artistic, I don't know, QA people who wants to find out the usage patterns of your application and things like that. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about is how you can use property-based testing on every level, and it's quite useful. So if we start with unit tests, it's, it's probably the easiest one, because um, I think PBT was actually designed for unit tests. <clears throat> so let's say we have this invader on a screen, uh, and this is like X and Y, right? So the uh, left bottom of a screen is like zero, zero position, so when we move an invader, the position should change to one uh, on a y-x, right? So once we create a property, it would like this. We would say, okay, for any invader, when we move this invader, uh, it has to be the invader with a position uh, which changes the y-coordinate. Make sense? Cool. And the, the, the cool thing is, once you run this unit test, it will probably pass, because it's a very simple use case. You don't have any dependencies at all. It's a unit test. You just run, you just created an object which is called invader, has like two properties, and then you just need to increment one of them. Uh, and if you check the data which is like, has been generated for this spec, it's, it's pretty, some of, some of it, it's, it's quite invalid as well. As you can see, there was a position with minus uh, x and minus y, uh, which means it's the invader is actually located out of the screen. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. It's a unit test, right? Unit test doesn't care about screen. And from the perspective of the, this unit, from the perspective of invader, it doesn't care if it's out of the screen. If you ask, ask it to move, that's what it's gonna do. Um, and this is advantage and disadvantage of uh, unit specs. Uh, by itself, it doesn't matter if you use example-based tests or property-based tests. That's what unit tests are. They're quite useful in supporting this particular union, but uh, doesn't actually give you any support in the quality or testing the whole, of the whole application, right? So integration tests, you can also use property-based testing for integration tests. So let's, let's see at this case when we have a laser cannon on the bottom and we're actually shooting out of this laser cannon and we wanna kill the invader. Um, so when we write a property for that, we would say, okay, give me like any random invader and any random, random laser cannon uh, and we're gonna create a game and then we're gonna shoot out of this laser cannon. And the game status has to be win. Uh, and as you can see, we have extra special condition here in purple saying uh, 
that position of invader and laser cannon has to be aligned by the X, right? Uh, so this is also called the restriction for the generators. So by itself, you can have very, you should actually have very general uh, generators, like really wide, range, really wide, without any restrictions. But once you come down to a specific spec, specific test, you can actually, and you should actually apply restrictions, which provide you some sort of documentation as well. Um, so the problem with the spec, the problem with the spec is it will, again, generate quite a random range of invaders and cannons. Even though we just apply the restriction that they're going to be aligned, you can end up with the case like this. You can actually end up with an invader which is located uh, underneath the cannon, and in this case, in this case, uh, you don't actually know what will be the result, what will be the status of the game. Is it going to be a win or is it going to be a game over? Because if you place, uh, if you place an invader behind the cannon, it's a, it's a game over, right? Um, and in this case, you will realize that well, this integration test is really hard to write because to make it pass, you have to. You have to add some sort of if-else conditions here and maybe end up with some sort of convulsive logic, which will be really hard to read them and maintain. Or, at, or maybe you just need to add extra, extra condition for the generator, which also going to be quite really hard to read and generate really random data, because at the end of the day, the data is not going to be that random. Um, so my point here is that um, Writing integration tests with property-based testing is hard. It is really hard. Uh, and maintaining it also hard. But at the same time, the value, I think the value of integration tests written with property-based testing is way more than unit tests. And uh, in my team, we're actually still writing integrational tests and functional tests with property-based testing. Uh, I will actually explain more with functional tests. So with functional tests, as I said, we're actually trying to test the whole application, right? So here we will generate the whole set of invaders, um, the whole set of invaders, and uh, a cannon. And then we will create a game and we will play this game, right? But the problem here, we have no idea what would be the status of this game, because there are so many possible moving things. You can, like, shoot out the cannon, and the cannon sh can move left or right. Uh, it could be we no lose, we have no idea. And that's what's really hard about functional tests. Um, you end up with writing lots of if-else conditions, and you will end up with writing too many uh, restrictions for a generator. And at the same time, I still want to repeat myself that uh, writing property-based tests on a functional level or integrational level is the most valuable part. Because uh, as you remember, when we wrote a unit test, all the examples passed because you didn't have any dependencies. And our invaders didn't know about existence of the screen or existence of the bullets or existence of the, of the laser cannon. And it wasn't really valuable, actually, to test. Uh, however, once you come down to an integrational or functional test, you will find out way more edge cases and uh, way, way more test cases, which actually makes sense. Um, so. Another thing is explorational tests. Uh, any, any of you actually saw people doing explorational tests? I saw it really rarely, because people usually just don't have time. They're too busy doing something else. Um, so with ex explorational tests, they are manual tests. And obviously, you can't use property-based testing for explorational tests. Um, and I have really, I have, I have an idea which I actually tried on a project, uh, which I want to talk about. Um, uh, so you can actually use property-based testing tools like Scala Check or Quick Check to help you to generate test data. Let's say you have a person, and person has quite like a you know normal structure, uh, normal data structure. It has a name, it has an age, and it has an address. And then you can think about it as a type, which is like name has a string, 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 and age is int, etc. right? So you can easily create a generator, which would look like this, uh, where name would be a name generator, age is a 
pos uh, positive number and address as address generator, right? Uh, and then you would create a person out of it. You would also have name generator, which would look like this, right? And then you would probably have an address generator as well. So what you're going to end up with is a set of generators uh, which you can use. Uh, how? How can you use these generators? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can generate thousands of them and save to a database, and then you can use it as a test data for your explorational tests. Uh, and it's, quite, it's actually quite valuable because I saw lots of projects, especially in, uh, I don't know, in government, when you're actually not allowed to use production data or personal data for the tests or for obvious reasons. And you have to end up generating this data or masking this data in some way. So I thought property-based testing tools like ScalaCheck actually could be quite useful to generate this data, um, even though they're not, it's not the main purpose of this tool. And that's why you're not going to find this in, in documentation, right? So just to summarize, you can use property-based testing for unit tests. And you should, if you're using property-based tests, you should use it for unit tests. It's very easy. And the amount of use cases is just enormous. Uh, you still can use it for integrational and functional level tests. Uh, the only problem is it's going to be really hard to write such a test. Uh, so what I end up doing on a functional level is I start to write a test just to explore and discover edge cases. And once I have the edge cases, I actually document them as an example-based test, um, which kind of works very well. Um, and at this point, uh, I learned it probably like on the quite early stages of my working with functional programming. Uh, that you can have so much tests by like writing less. And I was like so happy because obviously the more tests you have, the better quality is. Um, it's not true. Um, uh, so at this point, I want to tell you a story of how I changed my expectations from this tool. So as I mentioned, I work for ThoughtWorks. And in ThoughtWorks, we have this thing called ThoughtWorks University. Uh, it's a, it's a quite unique uh, program. When we hire un unexperienced people like uh, juniors or interns, we send them to India for five weeks to work like on a fake project and learn really basic and simple things. And I was lucky enough to be a trainer on such a program. And uh, by being a trainer, I actually learned, really learned quite a lot. And um, I just want to tell you some basic principles which actually changed my expectations from property-based testing. Uh, so first of all, QA is actually a role. QA is not a person. Role and the person are different things. What it means is that the role of QA can be and should be played by any person on the team. And the next thing, you just need to think about what QA stands for. Anyone knows what QA stands for? So it does stand for quality assurance. But then it also stands for quality analysts. And also it stands for like quality advocate and ambassador. And if you think about definition of these terms, it's quite funny because the, the first one assumes that you just like design tests and you run these tests. Uh, the second one assumes that you're just doing a little bit more. You're kind of analyzing things. And the last one assumes that you're actually advocating for quality. You're probably talking to business stakeholders and trying to change the direction of the product development or something like that. It's quite complicated. So uh, today, nowadays, what we, what we teach at ThoughtWorks University on the pretty early stages of like, your career was actually that QA has to be all of this, and especially the last one. Uh, which makes QA role is really, really hard. Uh, and also it makes me think, it makes you actually think what quality is. And we have really like simple and funny example about what quality is and what quality is not, um, which we'd like to show. So let's say this is, well, this is a hammer, right? And it's, it's a high quality hammer because like, well, obviously it has like a really nice grid. It's, it's, it can like, you know, put nails everywhere. It looks nice, beautiful. I don't know how hammers, how you actually classify hammers. This one looks like a high quality hammer to me. Um, 
and it will pass all the tests, right? But then you will end up with the, with the re reality, with the context, where you only have screws and your hammer makes no, it just useless, right? Uh, and this is re actually redefining what quality is. Quality is not just passing the tests. Uh, quality is actually fitting in the context of the need. So in other words, past tests doesn't actually mean anything. Well, it actually means something. It means that your assumptions <coughs> about your application are kind of working, right? But then you need to question the specification and your assumptions as well. And you need time for that. <coughs> and, and in other words, quality is way more than just testing. And it actually came down to me as a, like, okay, property-based testing is a really powerful thing, though it doesn't actually ensure the quality. Uh, it's just a tool. Property-based testing, as any other way of testing, is just a tool which helps you to analyze the quality of your work. Um, but at the same time, it's a really, really powerful tool. It helps you to automatically discover edge cases and not think about it. What does it mean for you? It means that you're gonna save so much time not to thinking about these edge cases with zeros, nulls, and exceptions, and you can just you know, focus on real things like, I don't know, thinking about the complex failures of your application and the context and the business context. And I wish, uh, I wish as an industry we actually spend more time on this rather than discussing what is the best way of testing our application. Um, Yes, and that's about it. Thank you. And uh, I have a little bit more. Basically, this is just a list of things you can use. It's like a couple of articles. I will share the slides later. Uh, and also, you can find property-based testing tool in pretty much every language. It could be Haskell and Scala, which is probably the most popular choice. There is also a sharp version. You can find it in JavaScript, Ruby, anything. And I recently realized that I'm on Linux Conf, and probably your weapon of choice is C or C++. So I'm sure you can find it in C and C++ as well. Yep. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Okay, um, I have always worried a bit about that whole problem of, or the thing about round trip testing kind of being a state, uh, yeah, it's either a trivial statement like if I double X, I expect the result to be two X, or it's really, really hard to find a way to express the, the, the round trip you get in anything other than a really trivial example. Can you talk a bit about what you found a bit with um, that sort of round trip, designing round trip tests so they, they're really meaningful? Uh, I think so. Uh, well, obviously, I think JSON conversions is quite easy to do, and I don't think you're talking about JSON conversions. I think the complicated part was actually round trip for, let's say, web application or API when you get uh, you have like get and post requests. When you post an entity and then you want to do the round trip of getting this entity and compare it, right? And obviously the format of the generated input and the actual entity which you get from the get request will be probably different in some way because you have like a business logic and service logic which, which does some sort of like data massaging or like conversions and stuff like that. And obviously this case will be hard, harder to do. And it just makes your test a little bit more convulsive in terms of like assertion statement. Um, yeah. Yeah, hello. Um, I just wanted to add to your list, if anyone uses Python and wants to do exploration type tests, there's a thing called the hypothesis which will generate test cases for you. Um, and it takes care of well-known edge cases with floating point numbers and things like that. It's really cool. Thank you. I actually have a question as well. Um, the, related to that gentleman's question, uh, I see a lot of 
overlap between formal verification and aspect-oriented programming type approaches and property-based testing. Um, I'm curious if you've seen any tools or approaches where instead of having your property-based tests, you would uh, sort of define those ranges and those tests in some form of uh, annotation or putting it closer to the code as opposed to in, in separate test suites. I think the best example is Idris. You heard about Idris? No, it's just a language where you can basically <coughs> define, uh, not sure how to, how to say, it, but basically type is way more than just integer. You can define a type with the range. You can actually define a type with the, the expectations. And it's going to be a compile time, which is really, really cool. Um, I've never seen actually Idris in production in commercial applications. Uh, but that's the whole idea, right? And there is also this language called COC. It's a theorem prove, proving thing where you actually first write a theorem of like proof, and then you can generate code in any language. For example, I remember some guy did a proof of C++ compiler, which actually was generated in a normal C++ compiler. No tests, just the proof that it's actually a C++ compiler. Um, and yeah, it was quite all right. Except it was really, really slow, but it was all right. Any other questions? All right, Svetlana, thank you again. Thank you.